Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 28th of March, 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Well, we're delighted to say we're joined today by Vanessa Beely and a guest uh, to give us an update about um, Matter Syria. Uh, all kinds of things, but we're going to start off uh, with, uh, with this, Vanessa, because uh, you gave a talk to a rather large audience uh, a couple of days ago. When was this? Was this yesterday or the, a couple of days ago? Hey, this was uh, Saturday night. Right. So quite a large audience uh, speaking in French. <laughs> yes, that was probably the most nerve wracking part of the entire process. Actually. Um, so uh, what, what was this event? Um, this was basically um, the Union um, Populaire Republicaine Party of France, uh, which was established 10 years ago. So this was a dual uh, celebration. It was 10 years of, uh, to, celeb sorry, to celebrate 10 years of their establishment, but also in a sense to launch their election uh, campaign. Right. I do apologize. I put the wrong lower third up there. So, so we, everybody now knows the name of our other guest who we'll come on to in a second. Um, so you clearly got a pretty positive response here. Yeah, I mean, there was a crowd of around, we've been told now, 6,500. Um, I was speaking basically very directly about the situation in Syria and particularly France's role uh, in the dirty war uh, and, and propaganda campaign against Syria, but also relating it very much to the recent um, terrorist attacks in London and describing the fact that, that, you know, our regimes are entirely responsible for both the terrorist attacks uh, in Syria on a daily basis and uh, the terrorist attack in London a few days ago. But of course, um, our state media gives no coverage whatsoever, for example, to the suicide bombing in Damascus um, at the courthouse that took the lives of um, many, many Syrians and injured hundreds more. Um, and has created an atmosphere of fear um, and, and trepidation in Damascus itself and received absolutely barely any coverage in Western media, whereas, of course, the London attacks um, had 24-hour coverage by our state media. Um, Nicola, if I could bring you in at this point, uh, the UPR party uh, is a Frexit party, is that correct? Yes, uh, the main point of the UPR is uh, precisely to get out of the European Union, out of the Euro, and also out of NATO. Okay. Uh, precisely, precisely to reject the confrontation between France and uh, the Arab world and Russia, etc. Um, and what size of party is it, and and uh, how does it or does it interface at all with uh, with Marine Le Pen's? Uh, efforts and, and is she really serious do you think about uh, the noises she's making about Frexit? Um, okay so about the, the size of the party uh, it has doubled in size in just uh, 13 months it, it's now uh, today 21,000 people and increasing by 250 so every day uh, so it will be 30,000 very soon and about the size, uh, about uh, the difference with uh, Front National, if you look at uh, what the Front National actually says about Europe, it constantly says that Europe is bad for France. But uh, what measure do they do they want? It changed every month. So a, f a couple months ago, uh, Marine Le Pen said that. Um, there has never been a question uh, from her of leaving the euro. And now she's saying the opposite. It's very confusing. The UPR actually made a video where you can see 21 different versions of what the uh, Front National says about the euro and the European Union. And now it has increased to about 25. And there, so she says one thing uh, and, then the, and then another thing so that everybody uh, is happy and thinks that she agrees with them. Okay, but uh, in the meantime, then UPR sticking sticking on message, as it were, and therefore uh, growing quite significantly. Yes, 
It, it was actually uh, hidden by mass media until the 10th of March when uh, when François Asselineau got his parrainage. Uh, there was a very, uh, very demonstrable uh, effort by the mass media to hide totally uh, the UPR. For example, uh, there, a year and a half ago, uh, the UPR had almost 2,000 candidates for the regional elections. There was zero mention of that in, in the mass media. And, um, and now, that, now that they have to talk about him, uh, they are doing their best to demonize him. There was absolutely disgusting article in the newspaper Libération, uh, which was pure pure slander. It's it's just insane yeah. uh, calling him lots of names. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, uh, Vanessa, uh, you are now yeah. also being attacked in the mainstream media. It seems, uh, and <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so this. Uh, had some words to say about you, your links to 21st century war, uh, and really pretty disparaging. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's as it's, um, Nicola just said, this is the article in the Liberation that did its best to completely, um, I mean, I think even the headline was something like 5,000 militants, which is, um, it's, it's a derogatory term for the people that came to that conference, describing them basically as activists. Um, or even, you know, if you if you directly translate it as militants. So it, it, it's, you know, trying to, to discredit Aslino as a conspiracy theorist, as somebody that adheres to even far right policies. They tried to um, conflate me with Soral, Alain Soral, that has a reputation of being um, right wing in, in France. Um, you know, just crazy. It's, it's exactly the same as saying we're a Kremlin agent or that. And in fact, I think they tried to also conflate 21st century war again with Russia today. So we just see the familiar, you know, tropes that we see in British media or in American media. It's exactly the same format. And, and honestly, it is so shallow and superficial. And I think actually what is interesting, I think it will actually have the reverse effect. I think it will push for people closer to actually know to defend him and to and to even discover who this man is. I think very few people are going to be put off by idiotic articles like this. I think it will have I think it will um, have an absolute backlash on them. OK, good stuff. Thank you very much. Now we'll just move on then to, to the Middle East. But before we get there, um, I'm going to give a health warning now because we are about to bring Theresa May on screen. Uh, and and I wanted to highlight this 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 just part of the uh, of the comment on on our Facebook page, which said, "Dear, this is the last time we had uh, Theresa May on screen." It said, "Dear UK column, if you're going to continue to show that horrible woman talking on your show, I would be forced to discontinue viewing on a daily basis." When she was talking, I felt a very strange sensation in my stomach. It wasn't a seasick stomach, but a warning of something bad. I know only foul words to describe her. So this is this is the feeling of people in Britain to Theresa May. So I felt felt that I had to give a health warning uh, for this for this slide. Now Theresa May was in Scotland yesterday, and she was speaking uh, to the Department for International Development in Scotland, uh, and uh, she was absolutely telling them what a great job they were doing. Uh, Somalia, she said, where we've pledged £110 million to, of UK aid to provide up to 1 million people with emergency food assistance. So she is saying this, but on the other hand, uh, everybody, Oxfam, even Pretty Patel, saying that Somalia heading towards massive famine. So if we're putting all this money in, you've got to ask why they're going, uh, going to have a massive famine. Could it be perhaps that this money isn't going to what Theresa May says it's going to? Uh, she also said that, uh, you know, we've put so many tens, hundreds of millions of pounds into Syria and we've done a fantastic job there. Uh, Vanessa, it was a fantastic speech. I was delighted to read her words. Uh, I, I think you can uh, appreciate the sarcasm in my, my voice here. But anyway, uh, one word that she didn't use, which I thought was really fascinating, uh, because Pretty Patel has used it quite a lot in the last couple of weeks. Pretty Patel is the uh, uh, Secretary of State for International Development. Uh, and that is Yemen. Um, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts on the Yemen protest. Now, we showed uh, a picture of this uh, yesterday on the news and made some brief comment on it. Uh, but you've sent me today uh, a little a short piece of video. And I just wanted to show the absolute scale of this. 
Uh, this is Sana, I believe, isn't it? And, but this this is just spectacular, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean it is. I mean this is this is resistance um, at its most extraordinary. Um, these people have have basically been under enforced starvation, famine, lack of water, lack of all supplies, humanitarian supplies, which of course is being enforced by the UN resolution 2216, which was a completely genocidal resolution. I mean, even under UN charter, it's classed as genocide, what the UN is enforcing in Yemen against 27 million Yemeni people, which is effectively starvation, humanitarian blockade that is being fully enforced, one, by the UN through uh, uh, resolution 2216, which is based upon the legitimacy of a resigned illegitimate fugitive president Mansour Hadi, but is also, of course, being reinforced by the Saudi coalition, backed by the United States and the UK heavily, um, that is bombing the only port, Hodaida, for example, which takes in some degree of humanitarian aid, and of course, um, bombing the Yemeni population on a daily basis, in, in predominantly civilian areas that are designated by UK and US operatives in the command and control center in Riyadh. Um, why is it, do you think, that uh, this war still gets virtually no mainstream coverage? Uh, I mean, it, I, I, have, I guess it's because we know that um, Saudi's imports are around 36% from the UK. The UK is raking in the profit of an over three billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia, to its Saudi coalition, as is the United States that's supplied over um, 30 billion since the war started, both under Obama and continuing under Trump. Um, and of course, there are oil and gas reserves in Yemen that we've spoken about on other programs. So um, the suffering of the entire population, plus, of course, their perceived alliance with Iran is probably one of the reasons that we're seeing um, effectively an echo chamber of any real information uh, on the situation in Yemen, or even the fact that Yemen has an elected government right now. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right. Well, look, let's uh, let's move on to Syria, um, mm. and uh, we're going to begin by uh, pointing out that a number of front number of fronts, ISIS fronts, have reopened in the last couple of weeks, uh, just mm. merely coincidental with uh, the United States boots on the ground. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to run very quickly through the, what I believe are the sequence of events. Um, we saw uh, in the last couple of weeks, basically, the Kurdish forces in Manbij that you can probably see on that map to the east of Aleppo, um, handed over the control of Manbij to the Syrian Arab Army, which, of course, went counter to the um, United States project there, which, who wanted the Kurds to maintain control, i.e. by proxy, United States control of Manbij and that entire stretch of territory that goes from Manbij across the northeast of Syria. And almost immediately we saw the, the effective invasion of Syrian territory by U.S. troops for the first time, or ostensibly for the first time. And at the same time, and, and I do not by any stretch of the imagination believe this to be coincidence, we saw what Andrew Korubiko has just termed um, attack theory Tet offensive, similar to the Vietnam offenses, where we've seen a series of fronts opened up by the terrorist proxies on the ground in, um, in running parallel to the US invasion. And if we look where those fronts have opened up, three new fronts in Damascus, so Joba, Kaboon, Dara, and then heading up to Hama, the east of Aleppo, so effectively creating a corridor which is going to deflect Syrian Arab army attention away from both Manbij, but also effectively the real goal, which is Raqqa. And we've heard more recently information that the um, SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which of course are 80% YPG that are under the control of the United States and have the support of Israel, have effectively cut off Syrian Arab army um, possibility to advance towards Raqqa. So we're seeing a very clear objective here by the United States to effectively take control of that northern area, potentially to create the, the, Kurdist, the Kurdistan state that everyone has been speaking about, which will begin the partitioning process in Syria. Uh, will it also begin a partitioning process in Iraq then? 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what uh, what else is going on? Um, well, if we also look, I mean, if if we also look, I've been speaking to people in Damascus for the last couple of days, and I have to say, the fear level now that I'm hearing in Damascus is greater than I've ever heard before. People are genuinely frightened. Um, Joe Barr has been uh, largely taken back by the Syrian Arab army, killing over a thousand uh, Takfiri militants. But the, the Takfiri channels are putting out um, information that now they will start attacking civilians in Damascus via the suicide bombing techniques. So there is a huge degree of fear in Damascus, and that needs to be emphasized. What we're looking at here. Um, is an organization called Amalia.org, which was set up by um, an Israeli guy, Moti Kahana, um, who is a particularly interesting individual. He set up this organization um, with the final objective to create effectively a safe zone in the south of Syria, incorporating um, Golan Heights, which of course is the highly um, disputed territory that, that Israel took in 1967, um, but also spreading into the Druze territory in the south also. Now the Druze have been always fiercely loyal to Assad. Now this guy's background is very interesting. I mean, there's quite a lot of research available on him on the internet, but he basically has a direct line into Trump's um, advisor, Bannon, um, he funded with Qatar the Caesar report, which we know now is currently being used to um, to enforce the Caesar bill in Congress, which will effectively increase the humanitarian sanctions on the Syrian people. Um, and we also know that um, this guy is bringing allegedly Syrians fighters, so free Syrian army extremist moderates and Nusra front fighters from Syria into Israel for medical treatment before releasing them back into Syria. Uh, and that's, and what that's he, through that organization? That's through Amalia. He had various other NGOs before he set up Amalia in, um, I think it was 2013. Um, and effectively, what he is campaigning for and what he is using Bannon as leverage for is to create this safe zone in the south of Syria, um, which will house what he considers to be um, the Syrian moderates who are prepared to work with Israel. So this is a long term project that has been um, probably in the pipeline for some time. Um, but what is interesting is, is the coinciding with the Trump operations inside Syria that we're currently seeing and the fact that this guy considers that he has very close relationships with Bannon. He also, by the way, funded um, John McCain's trip to Syria via the Syrian, the SNC, the Syrian opposition party um, in, I think it was 2013, that McCain went into Syria on his famous um, terrorist campaigning trip. So this guy has had involvement, Moti Kahana, his real name Mordecai, has had close involvement with all of the manipulations and prefabrications of the campaign against Syria and the campaign to partition Syria and to secure Israeli um, security, military security, political security, geopolitical security in the region. And, and not forgetting, when we look at this area that he is effectively proposing as an Israeli safe zone, um, well, a, a safe zone for Syrian extremists who are prepared to cooperate with Israel, let's be clear on this. Um, we are actually effectively are proposing that Israel has um, a border with Syria that one gives them range, military range to, to target Damascus. It also incorporates an airport. Um, so this to me is a huge, um, a huge risk for Syria and it's one that, that needs to be highlighted. Um, I mean, this this map here is doing the rounds at the moment uh, and mm. uh, suggesting U.S. safe zones, uh, one in the northeast and one in the southwest, uh, yeah. a, a Russian safe zone and a Turkish safe zone. Um, mm. And really, I suppose what we're looking at or the danger that we're looking at here is is the balkanization of Syria. Absolutely. In fact, I mean, if we look at the southern safe zone, that's the Israeli safe zone that I'm talking about. So they've they've put an American flag over it to probably try and sanitize it. 
but that's basically the Israeli safe zone. If we look at the north, as you rightly say, um, Turkey gets its safe zone to basically break up the Kurdish cantons to prevent them um, combining and unifying and being a real threat to Turkey. Um, and you see Kurdistan in the blue to the to the northeast, which although again it says under U.S. control, of course that is effectively the proposed Kurdistan. Um, and then if you looked the uh, west, you see what is effectively Syrian government um, controlled areas being put under Syrian military um, control for the purposes of this map. But also what is interesting, if you go to the far east border of that Syrian government um, control area, that is where the Tet Offensive is now breaking out, all the way up that, that outer border, that eastern border of the Syrian government controlled zone. So it, it, we are effectively, I believe, um, seeing a very, uh, a very dangerous attempt to start balkanizing and partitioning um, Syria, which is, of course, what we've always feared. Um, right. And, and just to finish this section, then you wanted to highlight. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, we'll just mention, first of all, you and Patrick are uh, off to uh, the Middle East, to Syria in uh, a few weeks time. Um, and uh, so you want to get support for that if you can. Um, so, yeah. so please do support via 21st Century Wire if you can. Uh, and yeah. sorry, Vanessa, I had intended to put uh, Andrew Karibko's article in here, but I think if I think I've missed it out by accident. What what was he saying? What was the headline of that? Do you remember? Um, uh, I wrote it, so I should remember. Oh. I mean, I wrote the headline. I didn't write the article. Right. <laughs> um, no, basically, he's done some um, very interesting analysis of the current geopolitical jockeying for position that we've just been discussing. But he looks at it from a far um, more a visionary aspect and, and the role that Russia is, is playing in this current maneuvering that is going on, global maneuvering inside Syria. And it's, it's well worth reading. Um, you know, Andrew is always one of those brave analysts that is prepared to go where many people sort of fear to tread. And it's a provocative article, but I think it's well worth reading. Um, to to get an analysis, a, a wholesale analysis of what is happening inside Syria. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Vanessa. Now, um, let's move on to Ukraine, because, of course, that's the other uh, major potential trouble spot here. Uh, and, uh, Nicola, um, I know you've got uh, some pretty strong feelings on this, but we're going to start off with this foreign policy <laughs> magazine headline, the, the historian whitewashing Ukraine's past. And this is about... Uh, uh, Vladimir uh, Vyatrovich. Um, tell us about this man and tell us what your thoughts are on the whole Ukrainian situation at the moment. Um, well, the, this man is uh, basically uh, is supposed to be a historian, but he's a propagandist. And he's at the service of uh, the new government in Ukraine, uh, basically minister of history. Um, and what what he does, his job is to explain uh, Ukra Ukrainians and the world that um, uh, Ukrainian nationalists of the 20th century, such as uh, Simon Petlura and uh, Shukhevich, Roman Shukhevich, and many others, are heroes and that they have done nothing wrong. And what history tells us is that the committed many massacres of Jews and also of uh, Polish people during the Second World War. So Petlura in the, around 1920 and, and uh, Shukhevich during the Second World War, basically. And, uh, and people like him passed laws in, in Ukraine to, to ban critics of Ukrainian nationalists, nationalist movements. Basically, the UPA, the Ukrainian uh, Rebel Army, which committed massacres, and uh, and he, this guy, b b despite the fact that he's he's not a proper historian, he was invited in Paris to explain uh, his new vision about the massacres during World War Two, and his new vision basically. Uh, of those massacres, where there were massacres of Jews and Polish by by Ukrainians, and there were no massacres of Ukraine, Ukrainians by Polish people, 
but still his vision was that uh, the responsibility was shared between Ukrainians and Jews. That that was new. Yes. Um, and and why is this uh, why is this being promoted at this time? Uh, well, it, it's the continuity of an effort that started uh, right after World War II when uh, some of these uh, people uh, moved west uh, to Germany and Canada. Um, for example, the the, the wife. Uh, the wife of uh, Bandera lived uh, until the 70s, where she um, promoted this uh, this movement from from the West, and it's all part of um, a movement to uh, to destroy the relation between Ukraine and and Russia. Uh, so to promote that that the idea that Russia is the enemy. Um, and that Ukrainians, are, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, are uh, heroes that have never done anything wrong. They're they're a perfect uh, tool for for this propaganda. Um, and and just finally on this, then I mean, what what influence does does this thought process have? The, these people have uh, amongst the current Ukrainian uh, regime, if uh, we can use that word. Uh, it, it's it's huge because. Uh, uh, Poroshenko said that uh, the, these people who committed massacres uh, of Jews are heroes, and there have been laws pro promote, promulgated to uh, to punish people who would say anything bad against the, against these people. And and the amazing thing is that everybody in the West is okay with that, except with the exception, fortunately, of uh, Israeli newspapers who uh, have published some articles against Vyatrovich and against uh, those laws. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, did you have a comment on this, Vanessa? Can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I'd muted. Um, no, I mean, I, I, other than to agree with Nicola, who's, who's um, experience in this is far greater than mine. You know, we know that we're seeing exactly the same media obscurantism over the Ukraine and over the genocide that is basically being carried out in Donbass and the eastern regions of Ukraine, as we're seeing on Syria, um, Yemen and elsewhere. So we know that it's very much a similar pattern um, to the war that is being waged against Syria. Yeah, OK. Uh, Nicola, um, let's move on to uh, fact checking then. Uh, Le Monde here, um, Les Decodeurs, what's, uh, what, what's this about? Um, Decoder is, uh, the Decodex is a website, a, a tool uh, created by Le Monde, uh, by people at Le Monde to discredit any uh, dissident voice in France. So uh, the, the the main I think the main dissident voice in France is uh, the voice of uh, Olivier Berrier, uh, who did the, who runs the website lecris.fr, and he uh, for one was the one of the very few in France uh, to talk about uh, nationalism in Ukraine back in 2014. So. They needed a voice to uh, sh shut him up and shut up other dissidents. So this site says, uh, Decodex says, uh, don't go, don't use this website as a uh, as a source of information because he he lies, and um, and so uh, the the website uh, the blog Les Cris was uh, the only. Uh, normal website to be marked as completely unreliable. They had uh, uh, green for uh, mainstream media, uh, orange for some media dissidents, but the, uh, some for some dissidents, and red for uh, completely insane and for les crises. Okay. Um, well, uh, let's just uh, remind uh, viewers of, and listeners of this. Uh, Brian, you brought this up uh, a week or so ago. 
Uh, well, this ties in perfectly, doesn't it? Because um, we, we'd followed through the BBC doing the same sort of thing, Nicholas. We were seeing that uh, the BBC is saying we need to check news. So BBC has its own reality check uh, part of the BBC website. And uh, on researching that, we discovered it was uh, linked through to this huge organisation called Crosscheck. Which is French. Uh, largely French based, yes. And uh, if we look at the key um, participants, they are all of the major news sources. So we've put Le Monde, highlighted Le Monde with a big red. Uh, Liberation's there as well, that was Arab. slagging off uh, Vanessa. Uh, indeed. Uh, we've got Channel 4, we've got Bloomberg. I mean, everything is there. Facebook is there. Uh, Les Echoes as well. And of course, we know that Google was a major powerhouse be, uh, behind this, putting the technology together to do this. And the other bit that goes with it, of course, this is not just about an internet base attacking anybody trying to get out alternative media, but they were also boasting that these news outlets are also now swapping journalists. So you can see the whole thing is being integrated they're going to believe the same things, they're going to report the same things, and their journalists won't even have allegiance to a particular organisation. They'll become part of this greater blob. I personally think this is very, very dangerous. Yeah, and Nicola, just uh, as a final comment on this, what, what kind of traction did the whole fake news uh, thing get in France? Um, and what are people's... What are people's attitudes to the mainstream media and, and the relationship between mainstream and alternative media? Uh, well, first in France, it, it got worse be because they are getting this, uh, they are recommending this uh, decodex in schools. That's uh, that's new. Uh, so we are more advanced in this uh, Orwellian nightmare. And uh, well, um, the French people now watch uh, less and less uh, television and uh, get their information more and more from the internet. So. Um, so I think people are looking for uh, something different than mainstream media and also the speed of uh, growth of the EUPR shows that uh, people are tired of the mainstream lies. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And perhaps we could also add into that, somebody's just reminded us in the chat box that the uh, French at the moment have got special web filters for the, for the elections with uh, Google. Am I correct in that? Uh, I heard also that some, I don't have any more information about that, but uh, it sounds okay. correct. It's, okay. It's, okay. It's, 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 right. Well, let's follow through. We first will go in a different direction, and then, as uh, our viewers and listeners will see, we come back on subject. So let's jump to Tobias Elwood. So this is the British politician who has been praised and fated for his um, uh, efforts to save the policeman during the, the recent terrorist attack in Westminster. Here's the independent headline. Uh, Tobias Elwood and his colleague Ben Wallace have been appointed to the Privy Council in honour of the Westminster response. Um, now, this is fascinating because, of course, uh, we could ask a question, uh, do ordinary members of the public um, get elevated for good works in trying to save police or other people, as has happened in the past? Well, we don't know. And also, it's remarkable that uh, this decision has been taken so quickly. Here's the other politician, Ben Wallace. He's Minister of State for Security at the Home Office. Uh, number 10, according to the article, said the Queen was pleased to approve the appointment of the two MPs to the Council. Uh, the honour means that Mr Elwood and Mr Wallace will be entitled to be referred to as right honourable and will be briefed on top secret national security affairs. So essentially these two men have been um, elevated to a very, very um, high level club within the British government. And of course, decisions taken by the Privy Council are much too important and much too secret to be shared with the wider British public. So this is elitism at its best. And very interesting that both of these two MPs are being elevated to the Privy Council. Uh, ben Wallace on his website has got some interesting things to say. He says, I'm a firm believer in small government. 
people and communities should be left alone by Whitehall, which too often tries to impose a one-size-fits-all approach to life. I trust teachers, health workers, police and parents to know what's best for them. Government should be in the business of rewarding aspiration and not in the business of protecting privilege. It should stand up for those who live by the rules. And I was very intrigued by that last comment because, of course, it's been Theresa May who has been pushing out the, the fact that we're now moving to a, a rules-based order. And this certainly seems to indicate uh, rules that are produced by an increasingly global style of government. So maybe a little bit of a clue to uh, what Ben Wallace really thinks about life. And uh, it took some of the uh, people who commented about this article, I think, to get in amongst the, um, the meat of it. So Julius here says, I think this is all wrong. The Queen giving out awards. Uh, Toby just did what any other decent person would do. This is highly inappropriate of the Queen to behave in such a manner. Why did Ben, Wall what did Ben Wallace do? Shoot the attacker, question mark. So uh, they're pretty disparaging. Um, it goes on with Peace Pixie. He was very brave, that, but there was another member of the public there who also tried to save this man and many passing members of the public who helped injured people on the bridge. They all deserve to be honoured. So people overwhelmingly might picking up on the fact that uh, why is it that these two politicians have been singled out uh, for such elevation? I think this is because um, there's something far deeper going on here than just a simple terrorist attack. Mm. Um, see whether you agree with me in a minute. Uh, this was another comment. Uh, that's nice, but what about the trainee tour guide who just up on the bridge was doing exactly the same, uh, the same at the same time with no thought for herself or danger to help a dying man, and she, she's been given no such honours. So people overwhelmingly picking up that something uh, elitist has gone on here, and uh, we just add this one in because this got a little bit deeper. Um, so we've got prompt critical saying. It's the wrong award for bravery. That's not what the Privy Council is for. As Wikipedia will tell you, the Privy Council formally advises the sovereign on the exercise of the royal prerogative and cooperatively issues executive instruments known as orders in council. Um, now, this is very, very interesting constitutional stuff. And I have to say, I think the, uh, the, the uh, writer, prompt critical, is hitting the right spot. What is it about the Privy Council that means that they want to bring in these two gentlemen? And uh, was it even the Queen that recommended them? More likely this came straight from Theresa May and her Tory government. So we get two MPs. Uh, let's bring them on screen at the same time. Here's Ben Wallace. And um, he goes from skiing to becoming um, a an army officer, Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in the Scots Guard. He then obviously gets a bit bored with that, so he joins the aerospace in industry, hops across to the Scottish Parliament, doesn't like that too much, stands down, and then he becomes um, a true uh, Tory um, MP in Lancaster and Wire. So a very interesting man, spent a lot of time with Kinetic uh, as security and intelligence uh, division. So this man, highly experienced in a whole range of things. So Tobias Elwood there, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Foreign Commonwealth Office. We've got the same sort of pattern, a captain in the Royal Green Jackets. Just five years, he did service in some interesting places, but he just does five years. Then he's into the Army Reservists, then he's into London Stock Exchange, and then he's into a global law firm, and then he's picking up degrees. I just sense something about these two men. There, there's similarities here. What is it that makes them so important? Well, I think it's that they've got their fingers in the security pie. Uh, this is uh, Tobias Elwood's Twitter page. Found this very interesting. He's effectively boasting about a, a debate on Africa, which took place in Sandhurst. So we say, is this the sort of thing that Sandhurst is for now? We're looking at prosperity security, humanitarian governance, and environmental issues. Um, we well, has, know- it, Has it become a think tank? Is that well, it's almost like Sandhurst is now not quite for training army officers. This is for training internationalist army officers. 
And I've put up a little reminder here that we, we now have irrefutable proof that Goldman Sachs and Barclays are now being integrated in some of the Sandhurst training. So where does this lead? Well, we can now come back into Syria uh, because here we've got Tobias Elwood boasting about his meeting with a gentleman called Jan Egland, and he is the, um, uh, the chairman of the UN's Humanitarian Access Panel for Syria. So we've got a man suitably embedded in all matters to do with the Middle East, and of course we bring in the UN link. So these are some of the comments from Elwood. Um, on the government site, he's quoted as saying, this latest UN report on Syria highlights the appalling suffering of the civilian population in eastern Aleppo caused by, quote, the Syrian regime and its backers. Well, this is untrue because if you read the UN report, it talks about a whole range of atrocities across a very broad front of individuals. So this is bias and spin without any question. He continues, <coughs> excuse me, the regime and its backers are continuing to inflict indiscriminate bombardments and use starvation tactics in other parts of Syria. So here's Tobias simply focusing on the Syrian government forces and he ignores all the rest of the detail in that report. And it goes on, the report outlines how the Assad regime used indiscriminate weapons such as barrel bombs, cluster munitions, incendiary and chemical weapons. Syrian and Russian airstrikes claimed hundreds of lives. So the UN report has a lot to say about brutality by the terrorists. Uh, Tobias Elwood simply forgets all of that. And obviously, Mike, this is deliberate. At which point we bring this up on screen. Um, what comes into your mind, Mike? Hogwarts or yeah. something similar. It's very dark. It's uh, very sinister. It's the Educational Collaborative for International Schools. And uh, what sort of thing is it involved with? Well, human capital, organisation capital, information and intelligence, safeguarding and transitions. And why have I got this on screen? Uh, because I found this organisation after discovering that Tobias Elwood's mother, Dr. Caroline Elwood, is editor of the International Schools Journal, and uh, that is intimately linked in with this Educational Collaborative for International Schools. What I'm going to suggest is that we've got Mr. Elwood. Um, he purports to be British, uh, but if you look at his background, he is clearly one elitist, doubly so as a member of the Privy Council, uh, but he's also an internationalist. This is about the movement to an internationalist style of government. And now I think we can begin to see why he might be interested in steering uh, matters to do with Syria and the Middle East. Vanessa, any thoughts? Well, uh, just interesting, actually, it brings me back to um, one of your previous programmes, uh, Admiral Sir Philip Jones. I was just looking for the, for the, um, the picture, the meme. Um, back to the fact that Santos is now considering itself, I think you said, a humanitarian um, purveyor, let's say. Let's go back to what Admiral Sir Philip Jones said and what you reported on your program, program a couple of weeks ago. So the hard punch of military power is often delivered inside the kid glove of humanitarian relief. So I think we're seeing a very clear correlation there between what was said by Sir Philip Jones and what is now being uh, well, how Santos is now being described. Uh, you are spot on, <laughs> as always, Vanessa. So thank you for <laughs> reminding us about that one. I'll just add to it that we're finding more and more information now about the organisations who are clustered around the British military, particular officer training. Uh, but we are seeing that that <clears throat> excuse me, training broadened right out. It's not just about military leadership, military tactics. Uh, we're now seeing that virtually every uh, military officer has sort of become a mini diplomat. Uh, you don't know whether you're actually operating for UK or you're working for the European Union or you're part of a controlled um, EU group. Um, there's something very, very sinister going on under the surface. And uh, it, it is essentially to do with the change, changing of people's views and values. Mm. I think we're going to be doing a lot more on this in the future. 
Are we okay. ending there? I think at that point, with a look at the clock, we need to end. I'd like to thank our guests uh, very much for joining us. And I hope that, uh, well, Vanessa, we expect to see you again. I hope also we can get Nicholas to come back on and tell us more about what's happening in France. Very little information is coming out in the UK press and media about events in France. So if you're able to give us further updates, that would be really excellent. And uh, as a last slide, I'm just going to remind viewers that uh, uh, Melanie Shaw is still in prison and, as far as we know, still in solitary confinement. Uh, so coming up to over 11 months now that this lady uh, has been in prison. Why? Because she is one of many child abuse victims that know the dirt on the British government. And uh, if she is still in prison, perhaps we can just say that uh, some good news. We understand that Sergeant Al Blackman, Royal Marines, is due to be released from prison shortly. How has that happened? Simply by public pressure. So well done for the Royal Marine team. And also say if we want to get Melanie Shaw out of prison, it's up to all of us to stand up and be counted. That's it for today. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.